So thanks so much for being here. Again, I want to look in the camera and welcome those that are watching online this week. Thank you for each of you that are part of our second experience today. And as we wrap up this series, I want you to know that there are already three other messages in this series that have already happened that you can go to our website, bridgewoodchurch.com, download those podcasts and listen to them so that you get the whole thing. All right, and uh, I am excited about all that God has been doing these past three or four weeks as we have been in this series about choosing joy, making it a decision in our life and not just a feeling, and we would love for you to listen to those. Let me just kind of share with you where we've been. We're in Philippians, this incredible letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church probably a lot like Bridgewood. It was a church plan. It was a dynamic church. It was full of people that loved Jesus. And he wrote this letter to him from prison. And, and you don't often think of joy and prison in the same sentence. But, but Paul had joy no matter what circumstance he was going through because joy is not a feeling. Even when you don't feel like it, you can choose joy no matter what circumstance you're in. So he chooses joy in the midst of prison to write a letter to a church that would last for, for centuries now and would speak to us about how we can have joy in difficult circumstances. So we've been talking about that. In week number one, Philippians 1, we talked all about having joy in pain. And aren't you glad that God, even though we might experience pain in our life, He can turn our pain into gain, and He can use our pain so that we don't waste it? It's like if I'm going to go through a painful situation, God, then at least do something through it. So that when I get to the end, I didn't just waste the pain that I had to go through. And so we saw that. We see that in the life of Jesus. He used every bit of that pain that he went through to bring something incredibly promising to you and I. In, in the second week, Philippians chapter 2, we talked about joy and purpose. And, and Pastor Dustin shared with us how, how you will have no greater joy in your life than when you're doing what you're wired to do. When you're doing what God created you to do. I look around, I see people serving all over Bridgewood right now. I had a few moments just to be able to walk around our campus this morning and see people in the parking lot and in the kids area and, and, and serving out in the gallery area. And you can see a joy about them, not, not necessarily because of what they're doing, but because they're doing doing what God created them to do. And I love that. You find incredible joy in purpose. Last week, Pastor Caleb talked about finding joy in progress. And we're not talking about just being busy. We're not talking about progress like just to be successful. But he so powerfully showed us that what progress actually is, is knowing and becoming more like Jesus. That's what progress is. Paul said, Man, I've gone through times when I didn't feel like Jesus was changing me. I didn't feel like my spiritual life was happening at all. But, but he was reminded that even though at times we don't always see it or feel it, how many of you know God's still working inside of us? And he wrote in Philippians chapter 1 that, that, that you can be confident that God who started something in you is going to finish it all the way to the end. Is anybody excited about that today? That God's not done with you yet? Amen. Why don't you tell somebody next to you, say, God's not finished with you yet, so don't quit. Don't give up. Come on now, don't quit. You're here today. He's not finished with you yet. Man, we're a work in progress. I know I'm a work in progress, and I love the fact that God's committed all the way with me. And so we come to chapter 4. Philippians only has four chapters, and in chapter 4 today, and we're going to talk about what Philippians chapter 4 shares with us about joy. So if you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 4. Let's begin there. And, and what we've learned all the way through this series is simply this, that our story is an expression of Jesus' story. So when Paul's about to write, he's saying, the reason I want to be like this is because Jesus was like this. And I believe that my life is an expression to the world of who Jesus is. And so if Jesus was able to have joy no matter what circumstance, then I want to have joy. And I want to be able to challenge you to have joy because our lives are a lived expression of Jesus' life. And so this is why he writes what he writes in verse number four. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. 
And I'm going to tell it to you again. Rejoice. 27 times in this short letter, he uses the word joy or rejoice. He uses the word joy or rejoice 27 times. In a short letter, 27 times, he repeats this over and over and over again. Why? Why does he do that? I, I read through the letter and I'm like, I'm like why, why didn't we get it after the 10th time or the 15th time? Why 27 times? I'll tell you why. Because we're not wired this way. Uh, we're not wired to have our first response be joy when we come up against difficult situations like pain or, or we don't always have joy when we're, we're bumped in life and we go through things that were unexpected. And so he goes, I'm going to keep telling you over and over again until you're rewired, until your DNA, this is your first response and not your last response. So he goes, rejoice, rejoice. you got to rejoice and then rejoice. you got to re-up. Nobody found that funny. <laughs> you got to rejoice and then rejoice. Like, you got to keep doing it over and over and over again because you're not naturally going to do it. I, I'm not naturally. Well, I, I thank God that, that God has blessed me with a wife that is a joy bubble. She is full of joy. I love that about her. Like, she is just joyful. And, and so most of the time, I'm living in her bubble because that's not always my bubble, and I like it in her bubble. And, and, and she's there, and she can find joy. And, 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 and so I know i got to keep telling myself this over and over again. Kurt, rejoice. Kurt, choose joy. I can't tell you how many times around the office, our staff, we'd be in a situation, and then all of a sudden someone says, choose joy, choose joy. Like, we have to make that decision because we don't feel joy right now, but we need to choose joy. And so no matter how you feel today, we have to choose joy. And so he says over and over again, rejoice, rejoice, have joy. And then he says this, do not be anxious about anything. Like, he doesn't say just don't be anxious about whether the Lions are going to win today. Don't just be anxious about whether or not your job's still going to be there this week. He says about anything in life, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing, do not be anxious. Can we just be honest today? All right, because confession is good for the soul. I loved their, our first experience. They were so honest and, and genuine. How many of you today, you came through those doors and you got some anxiety? You've got some anxiousness about your life. You've got some stress. You've got some concern. You've got some worry. And that's kind of what you walked in the door with. How many of you are there? Come on, yeah. All right, lots of us today walked through that door with anxiousness in our heart. And so we're now confronted with the Word. These aren't my words. This is God's Word. So this has power more than what I'm telling you right now. This has the power of the authority of this book behind it that says, do not be anxious. And I love Paul because he doesn't just say, don't be anxious to beat us up so that we'll feel bad about ourselves, but he offers a solution. Because immediately after he says this, he connects it to prayer. So, so let me tell you the secret here to chapter 4. Because here's what we're going to talk about. Joy in pressure. Joy in pressure. How do you choose joy in the pressures of life? When anxiety is high, when stress is high, when you feel pressured, how do you find joy? Paul goes, man, when I'm anxious, the reason that I don't allow myself to stay anxious or to stay stressed out is because I immediately pray. Now, a lot of times, prayer is our last resort. Like after we've tried everything, then we pray? No, no, no. Prayer was his first response. Before he, he took a pill to deal with his anxiety or before he tried to have some kind of pleasure to, to, to just wash away all the stuff that he was dealing with, before he went to all of the solutions that the world tries, he goes, my first response is to pray. And so he connects that prayer produces joy. He found that prayer produce joy in him and so he wants to share that with us today that when you're anxious when you're stressed out when you're under pressure he says prayer will actually produce joy in you and so then in the rest of philippians he's going to outline for us five things that prayer does 
that produces joy in us. And I want you to write these down. Okay, write them on your hand. Write them on the person next to you if you have to. But don't leave without getting these because this is going to change us. This is like, this is life. This is like what we're dealing with. So you have to get this, all right? So he says there's five things here that prayer is going to produce joy in us. Number one, he tells us this, that prayer replaces worry. He found incredible joy because the moment he got anxious, he immediately prayed. And when he prayed, it flipped worry and anxiety to trust. It, into God, I, I am not going to allow this worry to consume me, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to look to you right now in this moment. And so he replaces worry with prayer. I'll be honest with you, this is often where we kind of get off. Because a lot of times when we face the anxiety of life, that's when we all try to take control. Like, isn't that where we kind of jump in and go, okay, I've got to solve this now. I've got to do something. I've got to get myself out of this. And so our natural reaction is to get control, not to give up control. And, and so he's, he's trying to tell us here, here's how I replace worry. This is why it, it, it brings joy to me, is because I take that worry and I flip it. Man, I flip it right on its head, and I, I just start praying immediately, and it takes that anxiety and that stress away. And, and so he's teaching us here, because the word anxious there, if you were to translate, the Bible in the New Testament was written in Greek, so if you took that word in Greek and translated it into our English word, it's the word strangle. It's the idea of being strangled. I don't know if you've ever been strangled before, uh, but, but you feel like you're choking, you feel like you're suffocating. That's what anxiety does. Okay, It gets its hands around your neck and it just chokes you. And, and wh- while it's strangling you, you feel like there's no way out. You feel like you're, you're dying. You feel like, like the situation is just collapsing in on you. And so he says, when you feel that way, prayer is your first response. Because prayer will immediately flip that worry around and, and give it back to God. It's not that, hey, you need to try to do some positive mental, like, hey, just it's not really happening. I'm not going to name this or claim it, or I'm not going to believe this. No, that's not what he's saying. He's going, listen, the situation's real, but you need to flip it now, and you need to flip that worry into prayer. And so he does that there, because you know what? Here's the deal. All right, worry, man, it takes so much energy to worry, doesn't it? It takes so much physical energy. It takes so much mental and emotional energy. When you're worrying about something that statistics say most of the time doesn't even happen. So you go through all of this energy and, and you get yourself all, all, all jacked up and, and, and people are so, that's why they're so uptight today, man. You, you cut somebody off in the church parking lot and they're out of their car and they're ready to fight you. Now, I'm sorry for doing that, but I, the Lord's working on me, all right? Why? Because we're so jacked up because, because that anxiety takes over our lives and, and we're worrying about it rather than coming and going, God, I, I, I need to pray in this moment. This is my first response. And, and so we do that. And, and, and Jesus even said these words. Jesus even said, who can add a single hour to their life by worrying? So, you know, a lot of times people ask Jesus the questions. I love when Jesus asks us the questions. So he's asking us right now, who here can add anything to your life by being anxious and worrying about something? Anyone? Anyone? No? How's that working for you? It's not working. It's not adding anything. Nothing is happening except getting yourself all worked up for actually nothing, for something that may not even happen at all. And so I love what Jesus says. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus isn't trying to deny the fact that there are troubles, that there are challenges, that there are difficulties, that anxieties exist. But he goes, listen, worrying isn't going to do anything, so do something productive Do something that will actually produce joy in you. Turn your worry into prayer. Turn your anxiety into prayer. 
You say, oh, oh, oh you know, I, I prayed, but, but I, I, don't really, I, don't really, I don't really feel anything when I pray. So I, I just feel like I just get consumed with worry. Catch us now. Ready? What we worry about the most is what we trust God the least with. I know this is going to sting for a minute, but it's truth, okay? What we worry about the most is where we trust God the least. Like if you're always worried about money, then that's probably where you trust God the least. If you're wondering and worried about what your future is and what you should be doing, then that's probably where you trust God the least with what He's doing. And so, so it just, it, it's, it's self identifying to us to go, God, if I'm worrying about this, if I'm anxious about this, then have I really come to you with it? Or, or am I trying to do it myself? If I'm trying to do it myself, then I'm going to reap the benefits of stress and, and anxiety and all of the stuff that comes along with it. And he says, no, 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 we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that at all. Okay. Number two, prayer relinquishes control. Prayer relinquishes control. So, so here's what he says. But in every situation, not some situations, not only situations that seem spiritual, any situation that you and I go through, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. I love it because even when Paul's coming in prayer, he's already full of joy thanking God for the answer before he's even prayed. Like, he's so already full of joy that he's going, God, I'm bringing this to you, and, and I'm, I'm even thanking you right now that you're hearing me and that you can do something about this. And so he says, present your request to God. So here's what prayer does. Here's why it brought joy to Paul's life, because it took control out of his hands and relinquished control to God. Listen, if you present something to someone, if I say, Dallas, I want to I wanna give you my iPhone, okay? Uh, and, and I present it to him, what am I doing? I'm giving up control of this, and I'm giving it to him. That's what presenting it means. So if we have truly presented our anxiety and our stress and our difficulties to God, that means we relinquished control of it, and we gave it to him. We said, it's, it's not mine now, it's yours. And because you can't, you can't co-control things with God. Like, he just doesn't work that way. All right? you, you can't have one hand on it, and he's got one hand on it, and you're both going to try to be in control. It doesn't work that way. You've got to give up that control. That's where Paul said the joy came. Because the weight of that got off of me, and I gave it to him. Like, here you go, you can have it, here you go. And then watch this now, and this is what he says. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Right there is how you know whether you relinquish control or not. That's how you can ask yourself right now, did I really present that request to God? Because if you got filled with peace... If that peace is guarding your heart and mind, then you gave it to Him. If you don't have peace, if you're still full of anxiety and stress, then here's what I would say. I would question whether or not we've truly given it to God. I would question whether or not we've actually relinquished control of it or are we trying to co-control? A lot of times we're, we're not even trying to co-control. We're trying to take control and then tell God how to do it. That's what we're doing a lot of times. And so no wonder the anxiety doesn't go away. No wonder we still go through and we don't find any joy even when we're going through pressured situations because the reality is we're still carrying the weight of it. It can't be God's problem and our problem at the same time. Like, it can't be. It's either His problem or it's your problem. But it can't be both of our problems. So you can choose to relinquish control to Him today and walk out different, 
Or you, you could just grab a hold of control and go, okay, Kurt, but, but I'm going to try. I, I trust myself more than I trust God. I, I, I'm in charge of my life. I'm going to do this. And so then you hold on to it and then try to walk through this week with peace that's going to guard your heart and mind against all of the stress and anxiety that you're going to be filled with. And so Paul says, here's what I've learned. Here, and my life's an expression of Jesus' life, so I want you to get this too, so I'm going to tell you it again. Rejoice, have joy. And here's how you do it. Relinquish control. That's where you're going to find joy. Um, I love this verse, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety. You know what that means? It literally means... To throw it on someone else. Has anyone here ever cast a fishing pole before? Like cast a lure from a fishing pole? Like what do you do, right? You throw it and you release it. You, you get rid of it. That's what you do. You get rid of it. And so he's trying to teach us something here that's so powerful. So I was thinking about this this week. I'm like, okay, this is what we do, right? We get, we, we've got all of our stress, all of our anxiety, all of our issues and we go to God in prayer, and we kind of roll into prayer, and we're like, okay, God, I got a bucket full for you this week. And we roll it all in there, and, and, and then we pray, and, and then when we're done praying, we take it all with us. We're like, okay, God, I prayed, I said some nice words, I tried to do things. I didn't really, I didn't really replace worry at all. I didn't really give you control, so therefore I'm walking back out the door with all of the same stress and anxiety and pressure that I brought in. But that's not what 1 Peter says. 1 Peter says you can actually come into prayer like this and then pray and then go, okay God, here you go. It's all yours. That's what it says. That's what it means. Like, I'm not making this up. That's what cast all of your anxiety. And then I walk out and I go, it's not my problem. Now, that doesn't mean you just act lazy. That doesn't mean you don't have faith. That doesn't mean you don't. What it does is it takes the weight off of you. That's what it does. It takes all of that pressure and anxiety and says, I'm going to put God in charge of the outcome of this rather than me. Now, I'm going to do stuff. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to listen to his voice. I'm going to pray. I'm going to, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do. But the weight of it and the outcome of it is on him, not on me. I don't know about you, but that's good. That's what we need. And we need to cast that on him. I love what the Phillips translation of that verse says. It says, you can throw the whole weight of your anxieties on him, for you are his personal concern. That's exactly what that verse means. That's exactly what he was saying. Listen, you're not bothering God by casting all of your anxiety on him. That's actually what he wants you to do. So you don't have to feel guilty right now, like, oh, the only reason I go to church is so that I can just, I can just dump on God, and then I'm going to walk out, and I'm going to feel guilty the rest of the week, like, oh, God, you just, you know, I'm not big enough to carry my own problems and my own issues, and all I do is just come and throw up on you every week. And Do you understand that's what God wants? God wants us to bring all of that to Him. That's why Paul, in the midst of prison, or whether he's floating out in the Mediterranean Sea because his ship sank, or whether he was on a lonely night on a desert island, he still had joy because he relinquished control and the outcome to God, and he said, God, I can't change any of this but I can trust you for the outcome and I'm going to trust you and I'm going to give it to you. And so I love that. He just relinquishes the control over to God. Number four, or number three, prayer regulates my thinking. Prayer regulates my thinking. Do you understand that anxiety and stress and all of those issues mess with our minds? That's why at eight and ten years old, Kids are wanting to take their own life because the weight of life is so heavy even at those ages. They don't know how to deal with it. Their mind is telling them you're suffocating, you're being strangled. There's no way out of this. And that's exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. But a lot of times that just messes with our mind. Stress has a way of 
messing with our minds and causing us to do things that it's like, why did I do that? Why would I even think that way? Because it's meant to mess our minds. And so Paul says this, here's what we need to do. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, think about these things. Let me ask you a question. When do you think this way? You think this way when you pray. That's when you think this way. Like when I'm praying, I'm going, God, you're in control. God, you're so big. God, you love me. I'm saying everything that's true. When I carry my own stress and anxiety, my mind is saying, you're being choked. You're never going to get through this. This situation is getting worse oh my word, your life is over, and that's what I'm hearing, and I'm not thinking the right way. And and can I just be direct with you? I I know this may offend some. I don't mean it to offend you, and I don't need to be the Holy Spirit to you, but we've got so many things that are coming into our minds today that we're seeing and that we're hearing that are screwing people up. And I know a lot of Christians, they just kind of have this approach of, well, I just filter all that stuff out. No, you don't. No, 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 your filter is inside of you. It's just full of junk. Oh, I can handle it. No, no, you can't. And he says, the only thing that's going to regulate this mind is when I'm speaking truth and I'm saying the right thing. And when I'm praying and I'm believing and trusting that to God, my mind gets regulated. A mind that usually is up and down because of all the circumstances of life all of a sudden finds some solid ground to say, I'm going to trust you, God, in the midst of this situation. And so he just allows us to experience it. Number four, prayer reveals contentment. So, so he realizes that here's what brought Paul joy. No matter what situation he was in, he could find contentment. So he writes, he says there, listen, I, I, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. He, he tells us there, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So, so imagine this. Here's, what, here's why prayer brought Paul joy, is because he looked at each of those situations and said, God, if you are allowing this to happen to me, then I'm going to be content. I, I don't read through Paul's writings where he fills all of his letters with God get me out of all these situations God get me out of prison God get me a life raft God why do you keep sending these people to beat me and whip me and oh God get me out of it's not there no I'm not saying he didn't pray to get out of prison he did I'm not saying he didn't pray it didn't consume him to where he just thought God the answer is just get me out of stuff no the answer and where Paul found joy was God if I'm going to go through whatever I'm going to go through I'm going to choose joy, and when I choose joy, I'm going to find contentment that, God, if you're allowing me to go through pain, if you're allowing me to go through pressure, if you're allowing me to go through whatever I'm going through, then, God, I believe that you're going to do something in me that's going to turn it around for my good. Like we just sang about a minute ago, that what was meant to try to destroy us, he can turn it around and actually use it for something good. Or that, God, maybe you're going to do something in me spiritually that I would only learn if I was in the valley rather than on the mountaintop. And so I'm going to trust you and so God I just am going to find contentment that if I'm here right now I'm going to just be content with God you have me here for a reason and I'm going to find joy in it rather than trying to just spend my energy and my time trying to find an exit out of everything that we go through do you understand listen to me circumstances don't always change they may never change but you and I can change. I can't, I can't make things disappear. They may be in my life, and I may have to endure it and go through it, but what can change is me. What I can control is me. I can't control the circumstances. And so I can choose what I'm going to do. I can't choose necessarily what happens to me. And Paul said, that's why I have joy. 
That's why I've got something deep inside of me that sustains me through the ups and downs of life and through the pressures and the pains and the hurts and all of the stuff is because I've got something that's rock solid. Takes me right through stormy waters. Takes me right through dark times. Because I trust, I found a contentment in God that is like, okay, God, I trust you. I'm okay with what you're doing. There's some things in my life that I'm dealing with right now that my natural reaction would be to be anxious about. And, and, and I don't know if it's just, again, I'm getting closer to, to understanding this in my life than I've ever been, but there's just a contentment in me to go, God, whatever you're going to do, I'm okay with. God, whatever, whatever's going to happen, it may not be what I think, it may not be what I want, but I'm okay with whatever you want to do because I want to find you in the midst of it rather than me trying to control the situation and do what I think needs to be done. And that's hard. And I still struggle with it. But prayer reveals contentment in us. And then lastly, prayer relies on God. He ends in verse 13 of this plea, really. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is what gave him the strength to endure whatever he went through. He, he, here's what prayer did. Prayer changes your can't into can. That's what prayer does. Prayer, prayer takes and changes your language from I can't get through this, I can't see my way to the other side, I can't have the resources. It turns can't into can. And he says, now I'm relying on God. That's why I've got joy, because I'm not trusting in myself anymore. I'm not relying on my provision or my wisdom or my ingenuity to try to get through this. I'm relying on God. And so therefore... I can get through whatever I've got to get through. And he even goes on in verse 18 and says, that's why I trust in God. I trust that His supply is everything that I need. God's supply is everything. He's going to supply all that I need according to His riches and glory. So I can trust and rely on God. So Paul goes as he writes this last few sentences of this letter, he says, I say it to you again, rejoice. Find joy and choose joy in whatever circumstances you go through. And when you go through pressure, immediately pray. Immediately turn to God. And it will produce something in you that can't be manufactured any other way. Like when we truly pray, when we truly relinquish control when we when we come to God and we find a trust in him there 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 is joy like you came into prayer going I need I need I need I need and you walk away with I have I have I have I have everything that I need and so we got to choose joy we got to choose joy and that's that's what we've been saying over these last few weeks now. Choose joy. It's not a feeling. It's a decision. So we've got to make a decision right now. We've got to make a decision. No matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening in your life right now, no matter all of the stuff that is trying to squeeze you and strangle you, you can have a decision to make today. I choose. I choose joy in the midst of it. Would you just stand with me? Would you? Here, here's... Here's what I want you to see today as we end. Happiness is like one piece of confetti. Does anybody like confetti? Anybody like confetti? Like, I love confetti. I always watch. Like, did anybody watch the World Series after the game, and then they release all of the confetti? It comes out Super Bowl. They do it. You know, they're just standing out in the middle of the field, and Confetti's coming down everywhere, competitions, whatever. But, but here's the deal. I was thinking about this, all right? Happiness, not joy, happiness is like one piece of confetti. Okay, this isn't really confetti. This is confetti. That's, that's what this is, confetti. Like you can't have a party with one piece of confetti. Like it, it just doesn't work. You can't go through life just relying on happiness. 
Happiness is here one minute and gone the next. You can't have a party. You can't have joy by just depending on things that make us happy. It's just like this. Happiness is like one piece. Whee! Whee! I got an iPhone. Whee! We got a brand new car. Whee! Our kids, our kids pass fourth grade. Whee! It's here one minute, and then it's gone the next. You can be happy at noon, and you could be totally depressed at five o'clock. Joy is not one piece of confetti. Joy was meant to sustain us through life. It was meant to be more than just going from event to event, experience to experience, from one thing, oh, i got to find the next thing to make me happy so that I can be happy today. No, 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 no. Joy, joy is like this. It's like a confetti cannon. That's how joy is. Joy is a confetti cannon that's meant to sustain our life through the storms, through the ups, through the downs, through the trials, through the pain, through whatever we go through. Joy is meant to be there so that you and I could experience something. Listen, Jesus didn't give his life for us to have one moment of happiness, for it to come and then go, come and then go. Jesus gave us joy because he sent Jesus that will sustain us through whatever we're going to do so that we have joy that is sustaining. It lasts over and over and over again in our lives. This is what he came to give us. This is what he wants us to experience. Not here one minute, gone the next, right? Just come on, more confetti. Just let the confetti come. That's what he came to give us. And so, God, I pray right now, how many of you, you want sustaining joy? Not, not happiness, you want sustaining joy. Maybe you got anxiety today. Maybe you got some pressure that you're going through. Maybe you got some things right now that are causing life to feel like you've got an 800 pound gorilla on your back. So what are we going to do? We're going to trust Jesus. We're going to pray and we're going to say, God, I give it to you. So if, if that's you right now, okay, and you just say, man, I want that sustaining joy. I want you to just lift your hand. Say, that's me. That's me. I, I, I want that joy in my life. All right. I'm going to pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we want sustaining joy. God, I I find like too often we're just living from one happy moment to the next. We're just trying to find things in our life that will bring us happiness. But it's not sustaining. It's not going to get us through whatever we're going through. And so, God, we are believing and trusting you for sustaining joy in our lives. And, God, I'm just trusting you right now in the midst of all of this that we can experience it. All right, the band's going to come right now. All right, and here's what I want you to do. All right, I want you, I want you to experience the joy of being able to know that God is in control of all situations. Listen, we just sang a moment ago that, that God can turn situations that were meant to destroy us around and use it for good in our lives. I don't know if that gets you excited, but I can't stand there when I know that Jesus is going to work on my behalf to turn things around for me so that what was meant to destroy me can now bring joy in my life. So we're going to sing this, and I want you to get excited. I need a few people that will get excited. Come on up. Come on up, gals. Come on up here. Come and join me. Stevie, come on up here. Come on. You ready to sing this? Here we go. Come on. Sing it. 